how many were in this room when when um, I when we invited Dao to ICP? Anyone? Oh, there was one. That's great. I, I, you know, it's funny. I hadn't thought about it, but in one of those books, I see there's a fax, a fax. Can you imagine a fax to me? from Daoud saying something about, you know, he needs this for a presentation. Well, um, um, it's, it's great to, to welcome back Daoud ICP. Um, if you were able to see um, his most recent show this past spring at, at Mary Boone's Gallery up uh, uh, in Midtown, uh, you would have seen what many of us know, what Daoud has been doing so brilliantly for over over three decades, producing extraordinary portraits of uh, what are very ordinary people. Dawood's practice at its root is a collaboration with his subject, a performance, if you will, where he's able to ease his sitters into performing themselves um, for that instant that is the photographic moment. The result is an image of the subject filled with dignity, often grace, an elemental artifact that reveals a powerful statement of identity. Along with community and neighborhood, two concepts woven through the fabric of all of his artistic practice, there's an underlying humanism in all the work that he does as a writer, as an educator, as a curator, and here tonight to talk about his work as a photographer. In his portraits, his respect for the subject is apparent, and the results are at once powerful, poignant, poetic, and plain spoken. It's a delight to have him here with us again. Uh, please make him feel welcome. Uh, join me in welcoming Daoud. Good evening. And, uh thank all of you for coming out this evening, and uh, thank to uh, Phil for inviting me here. Uh, I was uh, happy to be able to uh, make this visit to to squeeze a little bit of time uh, out of my schedule to uh, join you all this evening. What I, what I thought I would do this evening, uh, rather than trying to figure out how to condense 40 years of work into 45 minutes, uh, I thought that I would share with you uh, the first group of photographs that I made, uh, Harlem, USA, uh, that goes back to 1975. And then to uh, share with you uh, some of the most recent work uh, that I completed uh, in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, and between those two bodies of work to share with you uh, my ideas about the work and the context uh, out of which uh, my work comes. Because my, my work comes very much out of the very real social world. And then trying to figure out through the creating of a set of relationships uh, how to give uh, presence to those people in the very real world uh, through my work, some uh, resonant presence. So the first group of photographs that I made in uh, Harlem, New York, had everything to do with my family's history. Uh, my mother and father uh, met in Harlem, New York uh, in the 1940s. And this first uh, image is a photograph uh, that my dad, 
the gentleman on the right, made of my mother and my aunt uh, sometime in the 1940s. I'm not sure about the uh, exact date, 1943, uh, I think. And this family history, coupled with the experience of going to see the Harlem on My Mind exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1969, began to give me uh, a sense of what I might uh, begin to do with the first camera that I had gotten the year before in 1968, a camera that I inherited from my godfather who had passed away. And uh, my godmother, uh, after the funeral, took me upstairs to uh, the bedroom. And she said to me, there's, there's something that I have that belongs to your godfather, and I want you to have it. And she gave me his camera. Uh, so that was uh, my beginnings. I had no idea what to do with that camera. I wasn't remotely interested in photography. I had no idea uh, certainly how to operate or use the camera. But getting the camera piqued my curiosity. And that curiosity was further piqued the following year when this exhibition opened at the Met. Uh, and I went to see the exhibition, not, not even necessarily because it was an exhibition of photographs. I went to see uh, Harlem on my mind because there was a lot of controversy uh, around this exhibition. And that controversy, without going into a lengthy history lesson, uh, had to do with the fact that while uh, Harlem was a largely African-American community, uh, there had been very little if any active participation on the part of the Harlem community in the shaping uh, of this exhibition. So you had an exhibition in which the experience of the people in the community uh, was being authored by people uh, from outside of that community, and that became a flashpoint. Uh, one of the few African-American photographers whose work was included in that exhibition uh, was James Van Der Zee, who was a studio photographer who had maintained a presence in Harlem uh, during the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And his work was, uh, I guess you could say, rediscovered uh, by a photo researcher, Reginald McGee, who was working uh, with Alan Shoner, who was the curator uh, of the uh, Harlem on My Mind exhibition. I say sort of rediscovered because those photographs had never been in the public arena in the first place. You know, those photographs were photographs that people went to Van Der Zee's studio to have made of themselves, and they sat on their mantle, on their tables. They were privately commissioned photographs that existed uh, in the home. So before that moment, they had never had a, uh, any public kind of presence. Uh, there was no reason that they would have. But through that exhibition, uh, Van Der Zee's work, in fact, became uh, public. And it was the work that made one of the uh, strongest impressions on me uh, in that exhibition. And it, it made an impression on me for, for any number of reasons, but uh, among other things, the ways in which the African-American community uh, was portrayed in Van der Zee's photograph was very different from the uh, kinds of images uh, that existed in the public arena uh, of the black subject, uh, certainly during the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And there was a wonderfully elegant sense of formality uh, to those pictures uh, that made an impression on me even at that early stage. So I started, I started seeking out uh, other photographers and photographs. 
basically trying to figure out what do I do with this camera, trying to come to some sense of uh, what my subject matter might be. And it was in that context that I encountered the work of uh, Wade Carava, first uh, in the uh, Sweet Fly Paper of Life, which was a group of photographs made largely in Harlem, uh, where De Carava lived. And the book was a kind of collaboration between uh, Roy De Carava and the poet and writer uh, Langston Hughes. And De Carava became the first African-American photographer whose works I saw, who was making uh, works uh, in the African-American community of black subjects that were not, uh, they were not studio portraits. They were not commissioned by the people in the photograph. Uh, they were not photographs made on assignment for Life magazine, uh, the way Gordon Parks' photographs in Harlem had been. Uh, so De Carava, because he brought his own sense of uh, uh, sub, sub, subjective vision, his own sense of uh, a subjective uh, aesthetic framework to bear on the African-American subject uh, became important to me. And of course, I was aware of uh, Gordon Parks' photographs in Life magazine. Uh, including the story on the Harlem gang leader and the story on the uh, Fontanella family. I was also uh, familiar by the time I started photographing in Harlem with uh, Bruce Davidson's East 100th Street. And uh, that work was also a kind of flashpoint within the uh, black and Latino photographic community at that time. Because there have been a number of black and Latino photographers who have been photographing from within that community for any number of years uh, whose works were not as uh, visible as uh, Bruce Davidson's work. And Davidson's work uh, in East 100th Street contained photographs that were both uh, empathetic portraits, like this photograph of the couple, uh, as well as uh, some more problematic photographs uh, that seemed to visualize some sense of uh, black female sexuality or black female sexual availability uh, from uh, Davidson's own vantage point. So the work was controversial for the uh, for reasons that had to do with the question of uh, authorship. Who was being allowed to author the experience of a community and what kind of uh, representation uh, was subsequently being uh, created about that community that went out into the world. And of course, uh, Aaron Siskin's Harlem Document was another group of photographs that I had become uh, familiar with. And I started, uh, I started looking at a lot of work, just going out, looking at photographs, trying to uh, understand how does one give some kind of coherent and resonant form to the human experience. Uh, I hadn't at that point, uh, been to art school. I had no formal training. And I guess looking at all of these photographs and going out and constantly engaging with work uh, became my uh, initial self-education. Uh, I went to see a small show of Mike Dish Farmer's work uh, at the Museum of Modern Art uh, around 1976, 77. And around that same time, uh, the Richard Avedon show uh, was at the uh, Marlboro Gallery. So I went to see these shows. I went to see others as well. I mean, I was looking at a lot of work that was not photographs of the human subject, but it began, it began to resonate with me that the photographs of the human subject of ordinary people 
were the photographs that uh, spoke to me uh, most deeply, including uh, this photograph here uh, by Gordon Parks. And uh, I started looking at August Sanders' work uh, of the uh, German population and community uh, before the war. And of course, uh, Walker Evans and the Farm Security Administration work uh, became other work that I began to study, along with uh, non-photographic work by, by African-American artists uh, like Charles White. Uh, Charles White was an artist uh, born in Chicago uh, around 1918, who made very uh, heroic representations of ordinary African-American subjects. And I started studying Romare Bearden's work. Bearden's work, Bearden was from uh, North Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, his work was basically about uh, his memories of people uh, that he had grown up with in Charlotte, North Carolina, as well as uh, in Harlem, New York, where he and his family moved to uh, when he was very young. So I started looking at uh, their work, along with Emory Douglas. Emory Douglas had been the Minister of Culture for the uh, Black Panther Party, and uh, he both designed and illustrated the Black Panther Party newspaper again with these graphic heroic representations of ordinary African-American subjects. So having steeped myself in these various uh, works and thinking back on the experience of uh, the Harlem on my mind exhibition and wanting to uh, contribute something to the ongoing conversation uh, about the visual representation uh, of Harlem and to contribute something to the conversation uh, about Harlem as uh, a, cultural, uh, uh, a cultural mecca within the social history uh, of African-American culture and my own family history. In 1975, I started spending time uh, in Harlem. Uh, I was still living uh, in Queens, New York, which is where I'm from. And I, start, and I started spending weekends and all of the uh, free time that I had. Uh, and of course, when you're young, you have a lot of free time. <laughs> and what I did with my free time was to spend days at a time uh, in Harlem. Uh, first, uh, not even making photographs, but immersing myself uh, in the community, uh, getting to know the community, and at the same time, uh, allowing people in the community to get to know me. Uh, I thought that it was important to establish a relationship with the community and with individuals in the community uh, before I actually began photographing because I felt that the work that I wanted to do, I wanted it to be as much uh, of a human transaction as I wanted it to result in photographs that spoke in some meaningful way to my own subjective sense uh, of the Harlem community. In relation to how it had been visualized uh, previously, you know, there's a long history of uh, black urban communities being visualized primarily through uh, a lens and a framework of various uh, forms of social pathology. And I knew I did not want to contribute to that. I started off uh, rather naively thinking that I wanted to make a positive representation of Harlem. And uh, ultimately, that binary of negative-positive 
uh, didn't hold up to the actual experiences that I was having. And so my ambition became to make uh, an honest, resonant, and poetic representation of the people in this community. And I start with this photograph because uh, this man in the boulder, it's the first photograph that I made in Harlem, in which I was able to, for the first time, uh, visually realize the ambition that I had for making this work. And it was a very difficult photograph for me to make because it, it's uh, the idea of the photograph and having to actually momentarily insert yourself into the lives of the people that you want to photograph are two very different things. And I realized that for the first time with this man who was there talking to a group of three friends, and I wanted to photograph him, and I had no idea how to interrupt their conversation in order to make the photograph. And that, to me, uh, was the first uh, realization that it wasn't just about the photographs, it was about how do you establish a relationship out of which comes a photograph. So this is the first picture in which I broke through uh, my hesitancy and reservations and nervousness about photographing strangers, people that I didn't know because it quickly dawned on me that if I was going to make the work that I wanted to make, I was gonna have to figure that out, that the work was not gonna happen any other way. So I spent roughly five years uh, learning how to make photographs by photographing almost uh, every day uh, in Harlem. And one of the things that I started doing as part of the process of making the photograph, during the time that I spent in the streets, I would also walk around with, uh, with eight by 10 prints in my camera bag so that if I encountered someone whom I had made a photograph of previously, which of course wasn't always possible, but in the case of a barber, or someone in their place of business. I felt that it was important to go back and, and give something to the people who had allowed me into their lives to, to make the work. Uh, all of these photographs, uh, they're all made with handheld camera, 35 millimeter. Uh, for the most part, uh, not as quickly made as one would con conventionally make photographs with uh, a small handheld camera. Uh, I was actually working in a very uh, slow and deliberate manner. Uh, at that point, I didn't have any sense that uh, certain kinds of cameras were used to make certain kinds of photographs. You know, and if you want to make a more formal photograph or a portrait, you know, this idea of the camera mounted on the tripod, I had no sense of that. So in some cases, I was using a 35 millimeter camera like it was a large format camera. And I would make maybe two exposures and that would be it. It was good training. So I spent uh, five years uh, making these uh, photographs in Harlem, starting from 110th Street, working my way up to 145th Street, from the east side to the west side, making photographs, giving people photographs, trying to visualize, among other things, the ways in which, at that point, uh, some aspect of Harlem's past was still visible in the contemporary moment. Uh, because I did have a sense while I was making these photographs that Harlem was, even at that point, uh, a neighborhood 
and a community in transition. And one of the things that I wanted to do was to make these pictures in which the past and the present moment kind of overlapped with each other. Now, there were some photographs that I made, like this one, that could have been, I don't know, could have been 1945, could have been 1932. It happened to have been 1975, 1976. But this idea uh, that uh, Harlem had a visible history, and part of what I wanted to embed in the work was the visualization of the people who were living the contemporary history of that community but also those who have clearly been uh, a part of that community for any number of years. And after after five years uh, of making this work and um, thinking about <clears throat> the early experience uh, of Harlem on my mind uh, at the Metropolitan Museum, where one of the other issues that was a flashpoint uh, at that moment was the fact that the photographs had been made in Harlem, but that the people in the community did not have immediate access to that work. So I thought it was important when I completed this project that the photographs that I had made in Harlem also first be made available to the people who were, in fact, the subjects of the work. So I approached the uh, Studio Museum in Harlem uh, at that time, uh, it was a very, uh, it was a small institution uh, uh, in a loft space on 125th Street and 5th Avenue. Uh, I approached them with the work and ended up having uh, an exhibition of the work there uh, that opened, uh, I think it was November 1978. Uh, but this notion that the museum as an institutional space uh, is not a benign space, that the museum can choose to play a very active or dialogical role within the communities in which they sit, uh, and the idea that the museum could also be a contested space, or the idea that the museum was a space that could be engaged with uh, any number of ways, uh, began with that uh, auspicious trip to the Metropolitan Museum uh, when there were protests going on around the Harlem on my mind exhibition. So when I finished this work, I knew that I wanted to present the work in the community in which it had been made, to break with that tradition of making photographs somewhere and then showing those photographs somewhere else. Somewhere different in some significant way than the place in which the pictures had been made. Which then served to, uh, of course, uh, convey varying degrees of otherness on the subject since the people who are engaging with the work are in some way significantly different from the people in the photograph. So I didn't want to, uh, to preclude the work going out into the world, but I thought it was very important that it first be shown in the community in which it had been made. So I had the exhibition at the Studio Museum in Harlem, uh, 1978, 1979, and that pretty much uh, was <clears throat> the completion of my first project, but also my, uh, my, uh, first, uh, my first one person exhibition. So to jump forward quite a few years, 
from 1978. And actually, it's a jump forward and a jump back because this book that you see here, The Movement, I first uh, saw this book uh, when my parents brought this book home uh, in 1964 when I was uh, 11 years old. Uh, a good number of years, obviously, before I started the uh, Harlem photograph. So there, there, there's clearly some relationship between all of this. Uh, the book was a book of photographs of and about the Civil Rights Movement, and it was being sold by the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee as a fundraising vehicle. And my mother and father had gone to hear uh, James Baldwin uh, speak in our church in Queens. And after Baldwin's talk, uh, they were selling the book, and they brought the book home. And they didn't say a whole lot about the book. They just left the book somewhere where I would see it. Uh, and I started looking through this book and was absolutely horrified by any number of the photographs in the book, including this one, which is one of the images that stayed with me uh, since that first encounter when I was 11 years old. Uh, I kind of think that my seeing that book and seeing this photograph, uh, I think everything changed for me uh, after that. I think uh, the experience of seeing this photograph and the book pretty much uh, disrupted or destabilized in some profound way the, uh, the very secure sense of the world that my folks had set up for me. Uh, before that moment. So this photograph, which is a photograph of uh, Sarah Jean Collins. Uh, Sarah Jean Collins uh, was one of the survivors of the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, on September 15th, 1963. Her sister and three other girls uh, had been killed uh, in that blast. And Sarah Collins, the girl in the hospital in that photograph, uh, survived uh, because she was uh, not as close to the force of the blast. Uh, as the other four girls had been, including her sister, uh, Addie Mae Collins. So that photograph, which I first saw when I was 11 years old, uh, about uh, 10 years ago, uh, that photograph just came back to me almost like a lightning bolt. And I sat bolt upright in bed one morning with the image uh, of that photograph uh, in my mind, which means I guess that that photograph had actually never really left my mind. I just parked it somewhere in some part of my mind. And I don't remember exactly what shook it loose, but uh, I started thinking about that photograph again. I started thinking about that moment. And I told myself that I, I needed to go to Birmingham, Alabama. I needed to both confront and engage that history. And so about uh, nine years ago, I, I made what was my uh, first trip to Birmingham, Alabama. I needed to see Birmingham. I needed to have a sense of what Birmingham 
was now to have something to supplant the only memories of Birmingham that I had, which were those images uh, from, 19, from 1963 and from the Civil Rights Movement. So I went to uh, Birmingham with the idea of making some work there, but having absolutely no idea uh, what kind of work I would make. Because how, how does one make work about the past? How does one visualize the past? How does one make the past come alive in the present moment? And I, I had no idea, but I knew that I needed to figure that out. So I made this first trip to Birmingham and of course, I stayed through a weekend, and uh, one of the first things I did was to pay a visit to 16th Street Baptist Church. I needed to see the place where this had happened. And then I started spending time trying to absorb the experience of this place. And I just started spending time there making periodic visits over, over about seven and a half years. because I was working on other projects, but I never stopped thinking uh, about Birmingham. And uh, these are just some photographs that I was making uh, while I was there trying to uh, visualize the place, trying to take in the, in the place and trying to get some sense, some deeper sense of this place that I wanted to make work in. And I, and I found a thrift store in Birmingham and started looking through old postcards and photographs and began uh, and began to find these, uh, these postcards in which they're very racist, stereotypical, uh, grotesque representations uh, of African Americans uh, that existed uh, in the culture at a particular moment that, that gave me uh, a real sense of uh, a sense of urgency in terms of why I needed to do this work. And I also started finding in the Swift store uh, studio portraits of African Americans from the South. So I started collecting images. I started collecting and looking at these images that I was finding uh, in the Swift store. And of course, <laughs> you have to realize each time I went to the Swift store, the prices were starting to rise on these postcards, and then of course one day the guy asked me, are you a collector? And I said, no, I'm not a collector, I'm just buying postcards, I'm a photographer, I'm an artist. But uh, he realized I was a little too interested in these photographs <laughs> that, that had been sitting in these boxes that no one was paying attention to. And then here I come, I start buying them up 10, 15 at a time. But it was important to me to have these images. It was important for me to look at and to live with these images uh, in the context of the ways in which the uh, black subject has been pictured visually. And uh, I located the, uh, the grave site of uh, two of the girls. I couldn't find the other two. <clears throat> I really wanted to, as, as much as possible, steep myself in the history and the experience of the place uh, before attempting to actually make any work there. And then I started spending time at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute that has an extensive archive of uh, materials uh, from the civil rights era, uh, including, as you can see, newspapers from the day after. Uh, 
I, I felt that there was information that uh, I needed to find out, information that I needed to steep myself in. I felt that there was too much that I didn't know to go there and to make work based on what I did know. I had to assume that there was more that I didn't know than that I did know. And what I didn't know, I needed to find out. So I spent time in the archive of the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, including going through the archives of uh, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, who was a very significant uh, civil rights leader uh, and community activist uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, who was the pastor of Bethel Baptist Church. And that church and his home uh, had been bombed as you can see in one of these photographs, uh, it was bombed uh, Christmas Eve, 1957. Uh, and Shuttlesworth and his family uh, barely escaped with their lives. But at that time, Birmingham, uh, for good reason, was nicknamed Bombingham. Uh, bombing of black people's homes, churches, cars, uh, was so routine that it was nicknamed Bombingham. You would hear bombs going off, and you would know that someone else's home uh, was being attacked. And I, I have to point out the, the photograph on the top, uh, on the right, is a photograph where uh, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth bought his daughter and three other young people to uh, register at Phillips High School uh, in Birmingham, which at that time was a segregated uh, school, of course. And uh, there was a mob of several hundred waiting for him as he walked up the sidewalk. And as he got close to the school, they sat upon him, broke his arm, basically tried to, tried to kill him, well, which they didn't. But in this photograph, there's a young man that you see uh, getting ready to uh, strike Reverend Shuttlesworth. And that uh, happens to be a very young uh, Herman Frank Cherry in that photograph, who several years later was one of the Klansmen who set the bomb at 16th Street Baptist Church. So I began to get uh, a much deeper uh, sense of the history. One of the things that I found out doing my research at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute was that not only uh, had the four girls been killed in the bombing of the church, but two boys uh, had also uh, been killed in the aftermath uh, of the violence that began that morning. Uh, one of them was shot in the back by a police officer uh, downtown Birmingham. The police officer said he thought he saw him throwing rocks at cars with uh, white passerbys. And the other uh, was killed by two 16-year-old uh, white teenagers who had come from what I guess you could call a pep rally. Uh, after the bombing, the uh, Ku Klux Klan and the uh, White Citizens Council called uh, a rally uh, to basically celebrate what had happened uh, that morning. And these two teenagers uh, went to that rally and left uh, looking to add something to the mayhem of that day. And uh, riding around, they spotted the uh, Ware brothers and uh, shot one of the brothers uh, right off of his bicycle. So these two boys had been, uh, for the most part, uh, other than uh, people in Birmingham and Alabama who know, they had been left out of the historical narrative uh, of that day, September 15th, 1963. And once I found out about them, I knew that whatever the work was going to be, I had to include their presence in this some kind of way. So what I ultimately 
decided to do over those seven and a half years going back and forth and questioning how does one visualize uh, the past or how does one make the past come alive and meaningful in the present moment, I decided to make uh, portraits of uh, African-American youngsters who were the ages that those six young people had been at the time they were killed. The uh, four girls were, uh, the youngest was 11 and three were 14, and the two boys who were killed, one was 13 and the other was 16. So I decided that while we only had a very limited visual sense of who those six young people were, they were almost an abstraction the four girls or the four little girls. There were more a name than individualized uh, presences. I decided to make portraits of young African Americans in Birmingham who were those ages in order to visualize what does an 11 year old black girl look like? What does a 14 year old black girl look like? What does a 13 year old black boy look like? What does a 16-year-old black boy look like? And then in order to visualize both the passage of time as well as the ages that those six young people never got to become, I also photographed African-American adults who were the ages that they would have been 50 years later and paired these photographs so that a portrait of the 11-year-old girl was paired with a portrait of a woman who was 61 years old. And of course, the adults who were in their 60s all remembered that day because they were in Birmingham. Some of them remembered hearing the bomb go off. Some of them actually knew one or two of the girls who had been killed. So they were the actual living embodiment of the memory of that morning. So I made the photographs uh, in two different places uh, because I wanted to make the work in places that also uh, resonated as part of the social history of that moment. So <clears throat> one of the places that I made the photographs in was Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth Church. I thought it was absolutely important that I uh, make photographs there. I had a meeting with the current minister of that church who understood completely what it was uh, that I was trying to do, gave his full support, uh, made the original sanctuary, which had just undergone an historical restoration uh, and hadn't even been used yet. He made that space available to me and told me, whatever you want to do, whenever you want to come. So the first site that I chose to make the work was Bethel Baptist Church, the original sanctuary. Uh, which is where, among other things, the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference uh, was created. And the second location that you see here is in the Birmingham Museum of Art itself. Uh, and certainly during the 1960s, the Birmingham Museum of Art, which had been uh, a segregated institution had nominally integrated by implementing uh, a Negro Day. So there was one day a week uh, in which African Americans uh, could visit the museum. So I wondered both parts of that history, that social history, to wrap itself around the subject, the, the black communal space of the church, and then the more problematic <clears throat> Uh, segregated space of the museum. And to make the photographs in the museum as a place where 
black folks weren't able to even legally enter into whenever they wanted to have them come there to be photographed, knowing that those photographs were actually also going to be shown in that same institution. So what I mentioned earlier about how the institutional space of the museum can be actively used and engaged. So I approached the Birmingham Museum of Art uh, during one of my visits and I asked them if they would be interested in uh, commissioning this work. And the Birmingham Museum of Art uh, contacted me uh, probably around 2011 to let me know that 2013 was going to be the 50th year of the bombing of the uh, 16th Street Baptist Church in 1963, and that if, in fact, we were going to do this, that would be the opportune time to do it. So with that, I started going down there and spent about six months there, uh, put out a call uh, using every possible platform uh, Craigslist, flyers and beauty parlors and barber shops and social service agencies, hanging out in Greasy Spoon restaurants, posting flyers up, because I didn't want to just photograph young folks from Birmingham and older folks, but they had to be a very specific age, which means that the outreach had to be uh, pretty deep and pretty continuous which I was doing right up until the last day uh, that I uh, was making the photographs there. So each of these photographs in these diptychs uh, were made separately, and then I put them together. They're separate prints that uh, sit next to each other. And what I was looking for in the pairings was ways in which the individuals the young person and the older person resonated in some way, uh, created what seemed to be a relationship, whether gestural, as here, or psychological, or dispositionally, or physical appearance. I, I, I wanted to uh, find a way to uh, make them uh, make something coherent out of what had been two very separate portraits to try to find some points of continuity between them that made each one resonate even more powerfully in the company of the other. So I had people come to the museum and to the church over a course of uh, five and a half, six months, uh, photographing pretty much every day. Because uh, I had to be available whenever the individuals who wanted to be photographed were available. People who worked couldn't come until after five. Some people could only come on weekends. <clears throat> And in some cases, the, uh, the resemblance uh, between the people whose photographs I chose to put together seemed rather uncanny. Uh, some of them appeared as if they could have been, although none of them actually were family members. And then along with the... Uh, with the photograph, which I should also say, uh, they're, they're made in black and white also because I wanted to use the material uh, that resonated uh, with the uh, history. You know, when we think about photographs from the 60s, you know, we think about black and white. Uh, and because they are rather large scale, they're, they're contemporary in their scale, but through the black and whiteness of them, I wanted to allude to the historical nature 
of the project. And in addition to the photograph, because I have uh, done video work in the past, I wanted to make another piece of work, a video work that spoke about and visualized in some uh, poetic way uh, that Sunday morning. I wanted to make a video uh, about Sunday morning. A Sunday morning that clearly was that, that morning, but had the quality of a quiet Sunday morning. Uh, I had read in doing research descriptions uh, of that Sunday where they talked about that beautiful bright blue fall morning, the light was, and I, and I wanted to make a piece uh, about that. And I also wanted to make a piece that, in addition to being about that Sunday morning, kind of embraced various uh, narrative threads of history and uh, the social history of place. So I decided to uh, do the video in four different locations. Uh, a black barber shop, kind of black communal space, and another black communal space, uh, a black beauty parlor. And then I wanted to film in uh, some more highly charged and contested spaces, uh, lunch counter, uh, certainly <clears throat> the whole rule piece of the civil rights movement, uh, lunch counter sit-ins uh, were very much a part of the visual uh, history and the visual image that I had uh, of that time, as well as a uh, classroom, because the school classrooms were also uh, segregated uh, social spaces. And I wanted to kind of visualize each of those social spaces, uh, quiet and empty as they would have been that Sunday morning, to try to visualize the moment before, the moment that we knew, the moment that happened uh, just after 10.30 when the, uh, when the explosion went off at the church. So I, I found, uh, found a film crew to work with in um, Birmingham, interviewed three different uh, Film, film production companies, ended up working with a company called uh, Six Foot Five to uh, produce uh, this video, uh, 91563 uh, is the title of the video that I'm going to uh, wrap up by showing you. And these are just some video stills from that. There's an installation view of uh, the video uh, when it opened uh, at the Birmingham Museum of Art uh, September of last year. Uh, the work was first shown uh, at the Birmingham Museum of Art in September 2013, uh, exactly 50 years to the month uh, of that incident. And just so you can get a sense of the scale of the work, uh, this is uh, two installation photographs. Uh, the one on the left, uh, the traveling exhibition of the work is currently at uh, George Eastman House Museum in Rochester, uh, where it will be up uh, until January 25th. And the installation photograph uh, on the right is from uh, when the work was installed in the gallery context uh, at Mary Boone Gallery uh, this past spring. So I'll end by uh, showing you uh, the video, and then uh, we'll have time for a few questions.